One of the new committees I put together a couple of years ago, I kept thinking about education and stigma and all those issues, and I had been working off and on with Steve Terrell, and I said, you know, why don't we make another committee? Because this is such a big issue. And when we did the Recovery Ohio meeting, and we came up with our 75 recommendations for one of our Recovery Ohio's, one of them was about education and stigma, and I thought that's something we should take on. And I knew the perfect person to chair it was Steve Terrell, because he was so passionate about these issues and so you talk about stigma and everything I don't know how many of you read People magazine I read it every night my husband's like why do you read that I said I need fluff in my life I need fluff and they run a feature every single week they've been doing it now for a couple a year or so uh, featuring some famous person actor actress whatever who has mental health issues because their effort is to try to destigmatize it. So it's even reached that level, which is really important because people always look up to, you know, the actors, actresses, sports figures, and when they can feature somebody like that openly talking about their struggles with bipolar and suicide and depression and those sort of things, it really does help. But uh, we're excited that, that uh, Stigma and Education has, has uh, joined our, our team. They are one of our very, very active committees, and so uh, we thought it would be great to have them talk about what they're doing with their work. And he's going to have Lieutenant, I put my glasses up. Gebhardt. Gebhardt. I'm sorry, Lieutenant Gebhardt to uh, come up and co-present with him, and we're excited that both of them are here. Gebhardt, you were the first ones to show up this morning, so thank you. I was just excited. <laughs> thank you, Lee, for the kind words. It's, um, it's really give uh, me an opportunity to to strongly advocate what I advocate, and that is that we should learn to take care of our mental health as we have taught our physical health. It's, I don't know what's perplexing about that. So we, we have a small nonprofit, my wife and I, and um, we do just that, advocate. And we have had a focus on mental health first aid for several years. And it's not our only focus. We think it's not one size fits all when it comes to this education. But because what you're gonna hear is it's pretty basic, it's for everyone. And I say it's not who, it's who first. And um, I'm gonna start out by giving you a um, overview of the entire program. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Joe. And Joe's gonna talk about the focus on public safety and the version of mental health first aid public safety. And then we'll uh, come back and talk about some references, some quotes from people. And um, then I'd like to tell you about the options, how you can take the course yourself, how you can arrange for classes, how you can become an instructor, and then scheduling and some related uh, resources. So, Behavioral health, first of all, I, I am not a professional in mental health. I grew up on a farm, I went to Ohio State, I was in technology, management, sales, alliances for AT&T and some other, and SAS, a statistics company. And, uh, but I've always had this interest. And I've also had my own personal experiences that depression, anxiety, coping with it, with alcohol, and it's, it's not, and I thought, I never understood what's happening, I, I, I got it. But I took the course, I got on the mental health board, and I got retired 14, we moved from Raleigh to, to back to Ohio, and when I took the course, it started putting together pieces of a puzzle. You know, a puzzle you can't see, you don't know what the picture is. And because the course was very holistic, and it started talking about real examples and stuff. And you know, more and more I got into this, and I saw myself and what happened. Well, it took another level because in July 2016, my wife and I became members of a group you don't want to be in for Gold Star Parents. And um, suicide prevention took a very strong focus for me. So, as my son would say, you have to pay it forward. And this, I'm trying my best to pay it forward. Um, so anyway, 
if you look at college courses, they start out with 101 usually. If you're an economics major, you know, you get the whole picture. The one course that I, the only course I, I ever decided, to, you know, not to take or opt out and take it again was accounting. They started with how you list an asset, whatever. I was a farm boy, had no idea what bookkeeping was. It's because I'm a whole part learner. I need to know the big picture. And these are kind of the building blocks of that foundation that I think you'll get as one of the objectives of mental health first aid. As I mentioned, this holistic course, um, really the purpose is to lay a foundation and then teach you skills of how you can be a first aider. It's not to teach you how to diagnose or how to treat. We have, you know, that's something for somebody else. If you're a first aider, you're helping out somebody to get help. And that's it's true of physical mental health first aid. Or first aid is true of mental health first aid. So it's people helping others. So as you're gonna see from a law enforcement standpoint, we, uh, we're, it's a lot about wellness. You know, we have three focus areas in our committee. One is bringing mental health education to the judicial system. One is to the foster care system, and one is stigma. Now, I'm happy to say that I don't think I've heard anybody talk about, use the word mental illness. The AG talked about mental health. And you know, stigma, the stigma is really about mental illness, you know? Don't want to talk about it, turn around, scared to think about it, et cetera. So I, I think we're seeing these changes in our stig in the stigma, as I think the AG brought out, you know, it, it's all about understanding what mental health is. You're scared of what you don't understand. I use the word ignorant in my <laughs> training. My wife says, you can't use that. I, I understand, but you know, when you don't understand something, it can be, you know, hey, scary. So anyway, this course was developed in Australia. Uh, it's offered in 25 countries, 46 million. You can read the numbers. Uh, I think there's almost 60 million uh, in Ohio who have taken uh, 60,000. Sorry, have taken the course. And quite frankly, we are the bottom half of mental health first state in the country. Our neighboring Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and Pennsylvania have grab hold Michigan, California, New York. And you know, these are also some of the same states that embraced K-12 mental health education, teaching it in the schools. Isn't that kind of interesting? We'd actually teach this in the schools. So it's evidence-based. You get a three-year certification with National Registry. Um, and we're going to talk about the versions. The basic version that came from Australia was the adults working with adults. And then, it seemed quite obvious, adults working with youth, it's, a, it's different. Because the main thing that course teaches is is that kid acting up because they're going through the growth pains or do they have a problem or issue? That's a tough thing to do sometimes. And that course is quite different because it's adults working with youth. And you have know the stages of adolescence and things that, you know, typically that girls and boys go through as they grow. And I'm excited. We recently got the teen version. And uh, it's teaching kids to help kids. Friends to say to their friend and help that friend get help. And you know, what's interesting, some of the videos are excellent. They talk about what's a, you know, what's a uh, therapist do? What's your school counselor do? You know, it's taking that, if you're, if you're gonna go get help and you're a sophomore and you're having those things, it's scary, you don't have any idea. Who, you know, I'm going to a therapist. What do I expect? What do they do? So anyway, I like the idea of kids helping kids. 
Uh, now, the adult version, it was customized, tailored for different populations and professions. We have the first responder. We have those working with the aging. We have veterans. And we have those in the universities, both staff and students. And then we have the one we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to turn this over to Joe. I got to work? You didn't get trained on this. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you. Thank each and every one of you for the work that you guys do. Um, Steve and I have never met before today. This is the first time. He actually sent me a picture of himself. I said, well, I'll be in the uniform. But <laughs> um, Openly, I want to thank Steve and the work that he and his wife do. Unfortunately, like many of us, it, it took a tragedy to lead him on the path that he is on today. But here he is paying it forward. And to me, that's a sign of resilience. So thank you. He's passionate about this. He put together this PowerPoint. We talked several times. I could tell he was very, very passionate about this program. What he doesn't know about me, because he never taught, Molly does, because she's taught with me quite often in Click Notes. I really don't know what I'm going to talk about. I may go anywhere <laughs> until I see the group. And I had the opportunity to listen to some excellent presentations. So I'm like, OK, what's my role today? Why am I here? And I'm a man of faith, so often it's you pray and say, OK, what's the message? Why am I here? Because I wasn't really even supposed to be here, was I? Yeah, you were. Eventually. <laughs> I wasn't the first pick. <laughs> but you got a good reference. I did get a good reference from a good man. So you know I have 33 years. Some of you are rookies. Majority of that, we didn't talk about mental health. And all of you know this. I'm preaching to the choir, ain't I? But for you out there, we didn't talk about mental health. It's a weakness, especially in this profession. I'm the one you call to solve the problems. I can't have problems myself. And the reality is we know that's not true, do we? So I've been a supervisor for over 25 years. And just until recently did we start talking about mental health. Now, obviously, it's been out there. We've shared that. But for me, my journey started around 2018 when I was called and asked if I would be interested in being trained in mental health first aid. Through the Montgomery County, Alcohol, addiction, mental health services. I'm getting better at that. One other thing, when all of you introduce yourselves, I have to step up my committee game, clearly justice, because everybody's in committees. And <laughs> I was like, man, it's awesome. It's awesome that the work that you do and the things that we're doing to promote mental health. As a law enforcement officer, sure, a lot of the things that, that I've learned helps me on the road and helps me with the citizens helps me be a better police officer. But the fact of the matter is, it also helps me be a better supervisor. Really, more than a patrol officer because I'm a post commander. The majority of the conversations that I have are with my own people. And when it's not with my own people, it's with my family, it's with my loved ones. So the reality is, it's almost selfish that I took this training and learned what I did because I'm using it more for people that I love as opposed to the people that I'm encountering on the street. Now certainly when I do encounter those people on the street, I'm much more effective. And I'll tell you, there are many times where some of the skills that I've learned through these programs, CIT as well, obviously the gold standard, but my wife knows when I've been practicing, bringing some new skills to the table. And she's in the business. She's in behavioral health at Upper Valley. She does crisis support. And she has helped me as well. We're struggling. I'm going to openly tell you, Jeff, I'm with you. I feel you, buddy. For so much of my career, 
as a supervisor, I felt like I shouldn't share. I shouldn't show weakness. That if my people came to me, I would listen. I would try to help, but I really didn't have the skills. But I wouldn't share. Well, I went through some struggles. And after a while, it just builds up and accumulates. And one day you wonder, why is this thing bugging me? It shouldn't bug me. I've dealt with it a million times. And the fact of the matter is the bucket's full. So you have to empty the bucket. So the skills that you learn in this type of training not only helps with your peers, your subordinates, your loved ones, but it helps with yourself. So there's portions of it that are the self-care. I like the words that AD, AG has said. Self-care. We can all do a better job of that, can't we? So the nice thing, uh, often we're asked, what's the difference when you talk about CIT, you talk about mental health first aid? I like to refer to it in a medical capacity. In other words, isn't it pretty useful that everybody has basic first aid knowledge? You're at home, your child starts choking, it's pretty helpful that you know how to do the hammock maneuver. Or if you're out and you see somebody exhibiting signs, maybe they're having a stroke or a heart attack, you're able to act. But then what do you do? You're not a doctor. Are you a doctor? No, you call 911. And then who shows up? EMS, paramedics, who have additional training and can maybe assess it a little better and categorize it a little better. But then what do they do? take them to a hospital where the professionals are there. This is no different. For me, when I went through the mental health first aid, it was, it was a starting point, it was basics. And it taught me a great deal that I could then build on. And I decided, I think I want to try out that CIT thing. And I'm proud that our county is 100% participation. And I took one of my guys who's empathetic and he's good with people. And he went through the training with me. And we've had a few trained locally. The stigma that you talk about. So many times when I do training, I do all sorts of training. Molly loops me, and she's trying to loop me into something else. Too. But when I do the training, a lot of times I use my old examples of when maybe I screwed up. I didn't do so well. And you say ignorant. It's a bad word, but. I was ignorant, police officer, this may or may not have happened, time of limitations, I don't know. But the lady comes to the post, is struggling, clearly delusional, and as a, an officer who had no mental health training whatsoever, what am I going to do? I'm going to try to make her feel better, and I'm going to get her off post. So I came up with the old aluminum foil thing. At the time, I'm like, I thought I was helpful. She felt better. She left. She was happy. I was happy. I could go on my way. But I was ignorant, wasn't I? And now I know that you're not supposed to play into their delusions. That down the road, maybe she's lost trust. It is troublesome when you hear defund the police, and obviously it gets politicized and whatnot. But the reality is there are times where as a profession, we don't do as well as we could or we should. The community expects when they call us that we come prepared. As administrators, that's why it's crucial that we get our people properly trained so they have the tools. Not everybody can be a CIT officer. Mental health first aid is a good base. It's a good starting point. It's introductory. Here's some things to look for. Here's some signs. We'll give you five steps, the algae that we refer to. Take care of yourself. If you're interested and you think this is something that you want to pursue further, we recommend CIT, the next level, which is that connection, and that is so important. You're, you're right. Since becoming a CIT certified, I've also been on the crisis response team, and that's given me an opportunity. A blessing, if you will, to be in some of these meetings with people that are hurt. 
people just like me. I'm in my infancy compared to some of you, this whole mental health thing. Chief Will Balling and I, Sydney, uh, recently went to Dayton PD and taught the cadets. And I think that's really where this fits in, is at that introductory level, where they haven't had a whole lot of experience yet. They're not really sure exactly what they're getting into. But here's a few things to look for as you go through your FTO period. As you start getting these calls, here's things to look for. Hold the fort down until the CIT comes or somebody professionally can come in and help. And by the way, don't be like me, 30 years in, trying to unload all this baggage. Take care of yourself as you progress through your career. And aren't we in a good position, just like AG said? We're in a good position, this is an opportunity. Here we are talking about this. And we will continue to talk about it because it's important. So when we talk about mental health first aid, it's a great starting point. I believe every department should utilize it. And the cool thing is also, we know CIT, you can branch out, but this is for everybody. This is support staff. This is for family. How important is that family support when you're in positions like ours? It's huge. And unfortunately, we know the statistics, not, not very good for us, are they? A lot of divorce, alcoholism, addiction. Put that on a recruitment poster, right? No wonder it's hard to hire, retain. But that's the cool thing about programs like this, when we talk about retaining our people. When I teach this, I say, you know, it's too late if you're dealing with a crisis. It's too late. You have to establish that relationship well before the crisis. Or your employees aren't going to come to you. They're not going to trust you. They're not going to open up to you. And like so much of my career, I was closed off. They didn't feel like they could come to me. He's perfect. He's got everything going for him. He won't understand. So going through training like this, it opened my eyes. Be open. Share your story. And people then feel like they can connect. And that's ultimately what we're talking about, right? Connection. See, told you. Oh, the world. <laughs> De-escalation, we know that's a big topic. Um, with the patrol, we're also using ICAT, which is integrating communication, assessment, and tactics. It's all related. It's, there are times we know where an officer they don't have a whole lot of time. They have to react to whatever that situation is. But if they do, if they do have time, and they can take in that information, and they can assess the situation a little more accurately, maybe it won't have tragic consequences. Because in our line of work, we know the term, that's ah, a good shoot, it's a good shoot. There's no such thing as a good shoot. It just isn't. There may be me going home to my family at the end of the night. But we know the consequences, even if it is a good shoot, can be problematic. So we owe it to our officers. You guys are doing a much better job at it. We're a little slow. But we're doing a better job too, and it's it's a main topic of discussion in our chiefs' meetings and the stepping up program I did see your program when you went to Miami County. I can't believe it's been a couple of years ago, but what a great program. We had a great turnout, and it's just so nice to see. So with that, uh, the focus, dispatchers. We had a critical incident. Uh, I had an employee that was killed. Uh, just had passed her, and she was out on the interstate, and I didn't stop and say hi. But five minutes later, as I get into my office, I get the call that she'd been struck and killed. The interesting thing about that, Molly knows, you know, we have a member assistance team. Probably, I don't know, is it still the largest call out to date? I, we had three different sites that we had to deal with, with employees that were suffering. Molly sent the crew because I had officers 
that were on scene, we were trying to relieve them, get them to the hospital. We had family coming in, friends coming in. But she also worked at another facility, so we had to deal with those uh, employees. And then the dispatch center, we talked about communications. And so many times in our profession, we forget about the dispatchers and that communication component that they are suffering and they're dealing with the same type of incidents that we are. And sometimes we forget about that. So this training really uh, helps in that regard as well. So when you talk about the five steps, and then I'm gonna try to get back over to Steve. Um, you know, it's algae, great stuff. It's basic stuff and it's assessing the situation. First responders were always assessing the scene, assessing the situation. In this case, it's assessing self-harm. Are they suicidal? Once you do that, then it talks about listening. And not only listening, but listening non-judgmentally. How tough is that? We all think listening is an easy skill. Oh yeah, I can listen. Now the majority of the audience in here, you probably are pretty good listeners. My wife's a great listener. Me, yeah, not so much. It takes focus. And non-judgmentally, that's tough. It's tough in our profession, too. For the longest time, you were a criminal. I was going to put you in jail. Because I didn't have the skill set necessary to deal with your mental health. All I know is you're committing a crime. People called. They wanted me to come and deal with you because they didn't want to and I'm going to lock you up for whatever criminal offense I have. I'm glad we're away from that. Because that's not a solution. So you assess, you listen to them, you give them reassurance. That's why they call us. They want us there to, to help. They don't want us there to make things worse. And if a particular officer, and we all know him, they make things worse. <laughs> Get somebody in there that is empathetic and that can listen. And then at that point, we start trying to get them some help. Try to get them in the right direction. Encourage that, that help. And then the self-help, which is so important that we already talked about. So I'm going to skip all that because you people know mental health. You know mental health. Mental illness. No. No. Mental health. Good. So mental health first aid is the help offered to a person developing a mental health problem. A lot of times, what I've been encouraging my staff and my people is listen to each other. Let's not wait until there is a crisis. We know each other's voices on the radio. We know when they're stressed. We know when something ain't right, and the dispatchers as well. They'll start rolling that way. Well, it's the same with mental health. I had a high achiever, this guy, he just went out and he just loved to write a bunch of tickets. And one day he just sounded tired on the radio. I'm like, that's not him. And he tried to walk by my office, grab his radio and leave. And I said, no, get your butt in here, let's talk. And he was dealing with a lot of major stuff. Initially, he didn't share everything. He shared a little bit. Persistence, and then he shared a lot more. I'm like, oh my God. You know, a couple days later, he told me the rest of the story. I'm like, I wish you'd have told me that. That is a lot. You got a lot on your plate. So, from me to you, when I, we talk about mental health first aid and we talk about CIT, that's what I have gotten from that training. It has made me a better road officer, but it's made me a better husband, a better father, a better peer, a better friend. And ultimately, I think that's what we're all trying to strive for. So, Steve, you want to take us home? I can. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I think, I think a very important point is this training is a lot of fun. There's a suicide focus, a section. It's tough to make that fun, and you don't. But it's fun. It's very interactive. You know, we get comments back saying, this is the best thing I've ever taken. And it's because we just don't slide them to death. You know, we talk and we have scenarios you work through, say, the steps you mentioned, okay, at the, at the, you know, step where you're trying to determine what the risk is, what do you say? You do the role play, do those scenarios. 
And the scenarios are, are those that are for that kind of profession in those kind of you know, situations. Um, and I think the interactivity just makes it you know, so much, so good. Now, I, I gotta tell you, in person is the best. And, but we have instructors who, you know, during COVID, the virtual version came out and they do a fantastic job doing, having interaction with, you know, up to 30 people, you know, on Zoom. Uh, some, some quotes. Rick Skelter is a retired police chief. He's also um, is now executive director for a very large nonprofit that's working with multiple boards that basically is a prevention education organization. The founder, Donna Dickman, is I consider a mentor. Rick is, like yourself, a CIT and mental health instructor, and they use mental health first aid as the first day in their curriculum. Um, and then Will Balling, I'm glad, I'm glad he didn't accept. He did a great job. I asked Will to be my presenter up here, and he was on a committee with us. He's a former president of the Police Chief Association, great guy. But anyway, he says, you know, it helps you to look past, you know, what appears to be the problem. And, in, and, and to, like you say, listen non-judgmentally, and to really understand, and try to understand, and show you care. The International Association of Chiefs of Police actually endorsed mental health first aid and, and, and correctly believe CIT is the gold standard. And, uh, but they feel like, you know, the program is it's, it's for those who maybe have, can't or don't or want, haven't taken CIT, again, maybe it's a first step to get them interested more. And then also for new cadets. They had their One Mind initiative. They talked a lot about mental health where um, police organizations would commit and pledge to train mental health first aid. So we have some ODRC people here. Uh, about three years ago, Eve helped me get in touch with Stuart Hudson. And, uh, and I uh, basically had a discussion with him he said, we really want our staff to be CIT trained. He said, but we'll look at the mental health first aid. I believe Teresa Jamison was there at that time. And um, anyway, and then we had another person who was a member of our foster care subcommittee, um, Kimberly, I believe it's Toshi. And she said, we're gonna get some money. So they have since trained 76 people in their facilities to be instructors. And they want to train staff who haven't taken CIT, and they also want to train inmates who are part of their mentor program. So that's real exciting. And I think they're working out things because what they found was the scenarios really need to be tailored to the inmates and the situations that they get, they get into, which is key, the role playing. Um, state of Rhode Island actually mandate that all take mental health first aid training. Um, I'll go through this. I think Pennsylvania is probably one of the largest. Their corrections, they've trained 20,000. And overall, we have, we're close to 100,000 who have taken public safety mental health first aid in the US. So some delivery options. Classroom, the virtual, and the blended. The blended being you take two hours of self-paced pre-study online, and then you come back for six hours of in-person instruction. The eight-hour in-person classes can be broken up in two and four-hour sessions to make scheduling a little bit easier. And the cost, often the cost, there's somebody else paying for it, but typically, Instructors will want $300 up, and the student manuals are, are $25. Um, I want to thank this young lady, Lois, because she was instrumental in getting Mental Health of America, Ohio, a money from OMAS, and they've, they put together a network 
of instructors, and I think they've trained since two years, I think 7,900 people across the aisle. And they do have a law enforcement focus. So they'll do it for free. Um, many of the county mental health boards will. And there's other organizations. I know, where's Jeff at, but Kent State, they've got grants, and I think they've got 12 instructors, and they do training within Kent State and students, et cetera. Um, then if you want to be a trainer, and anybody can, but you do have to pass a course. And it is a boot camp, and it can get stressful because you're put out front and you're gonna practice and stuff. Um, they, they have courses, the National Council, what was called behavioral health. And by the way, this came from Australia through SAMHSA, the federal government signed it to National Council of Behavioral Health as a steward and they administrate the program. They changed their name, National Council of Well-Being. Makes sense, doesn't it? So you, you can go get trained, anybody can get trained. If you want to hold a class, you first assign a coordinator and then you pick an organization to work with, you communicate it out, and then you find whoever that instructor is with the coordinator to work it out. Or you can send them to other classes, like, like I mentioned, Mental Health America. You go on their website, they'll tell you exactly how you can send somebody. Or you can host a class and you want to, within your organization. I want to thank Monica, Katie. She worked with us last year and uh, we trained eight veterans treatment courts across Ohio. I, I was, had the privilege of training one in Greene County myself, and we had some virtual training going on too, so they, they could choose. And uh, anyway, when she was with the Supreme Court of Ohio, and we, uh, we'd like to pick up on that, but we lost, the, we lost a good sponsor there. And uh, anyway, and we also worked with DYS in the reclaim program, and we had 20 courses last year, all of them virtual, and almost 400 people we've trained in the juvenile county courts. What we found was judges don't have a lot of time for an eight-hour course, and neither do court administrators and magistrates. And as I mentioned, this course, Mental Health First Aid, is a lot about one-on-one. -on -one. We've hooked up with Dr. Dooley, who has a two-hour course, and we're working with Judge Gill, and we're gonna train about 75 of juvenile judges, mag magistrates, and administrators in June on the two-hour. So we're excited about that. Again, one size doesn't fit all in, in mental health education. But I'm an advocate, start out with a holistic course, going to suicide prevention, going to something on uh, addiction, that's nice, but the brain doesn't work in just those, those components. It works together. We do evaluations too, and we have to, and they're turning to the National Council, and we get all kinds of detailed information if you want it. We, the class uses average on a scale of five being high. It's usually way over four, four to four and a half. So I think we've mentioned that I'm a member of Logan Champaign County Board. I've really seen the board since I've got to become more outreaching, more proactive, and less focused on just treatment, which I think is great. And there are I tell everybody, and I know we, had, we have an action item, Evelyn, to resources. They're a great place to start. And Ohio State has a resource guide that basically gives you county by county the resources, and it's online. It's a great, great website. Um, I mentioned Mental Health America. You can find a course, just Google Mental Health First Aid. And we have this nonprofit, and I'm glad to help. It might be as, as, as simple as ODRC, and I just introduced them to the council and suggested what they wanted to do, and they took off with it. 
and I have to give stepping up to, I'm, we brought to our county and, and you know, we're a rural county. I would say we are backwards in some respects, but we're typical rural county. And our board really, really, uh, one of the gentlemen really stepped up and it's making, taking advantage of all the value and benefits of stepping up. Uh, and certainly OMOS. So anyway, is there any questions? I got a question. How many has taken mental health first aid? I hate, I don't want to leave on this, but I can't help but think about it. We give a course to first responders, EMS and fire. Uh, locally, we had a uh, fireman, and uh, he, well, about three or four of them took it. Small fire department. About a year and a half later, we had a 20-year-old fireman take his life. And uh, my friend, I talked to him, I said, did you see the signs and symptoms? He says, I did, Steve. And I, and I, I was thinking, what am I gonna say to him? Because he took the course, he's gonna feel guilty. You all do, you know you feel guilty, no matter if you should or not. And I said to him, I said, you know, it's not that, you know, the responsibility is on you, but what if we had 10 people who have taken the course and just one caught the factors, the risk factors, and the signs and symptoms. Just one. You were the only one in that particular situation. You know, everybody else. You know, hey, before our son, I, I still think I, I would have seen if I had been trained. So it's not, it's not who first. It's, it's not. It's not everybody is, it should be taking this course, you know, because it's just a basic thing to do. So that's my commercial. I thank you for your time.